We are, we are so glad you're here, and I'm excited to be able to share God's word with you this morning. And we are in the third week of the series where the topic is about change. We're talking about finding the power to change. And so many times in life, many people, you know, when, when, when change uh, does come, sometimes people buck change. People are, you know, they don't want change. We kind of get stuck in our ways sometimes. But, you know, the Holy Spirit is the agent of change. Jesus doesn't want to leave us like he found us. Amen. He wants us to continually change, to become more like him. And this is the theme of this series. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down, that change is either going to bring you closer to God or it's going to take you further away from him. And so in life, either change is going to bring you closer to God. We're going to become more like him. We're going to become, uh, we're, going to, we're going to allow him to work in us and through us. Or we're going to make changes that actually, they take us further away from God's plan for our life, about with God's will for our life. And so that's what we've been talking about. And I'm excited to preach this word today. Second Peter 1 is where we're going to be at. And we'll be here for a couple of weeks in the, the second uh, the, the second book of Peter and the first chapter, and we're going to hang out here for a couple weeks, and um, I'm going to preach um, on the process of sanctification, what that looks like, because as we become more like Christ, it's what's known as the sanctification process. That means that, that we begin to walk a life that reflects who God is to us and what he has done in us in a life that honors God. A life that is set apart for him. And so 2 Peter 1 uh, begins with the first verse. It says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. I love he introduces himself. And he doesn't just introduce himself as, hey, I'm Simon. You know, I'm a fisherman. He, it shows the transformation process. He says, Simon Peter, I'm using the name that Jesus gave me. He gave me this name. He changed my name. I was only Simon when I was shaky and shifty and, and salty. And I was, you know, somebody that didn't, you know, get along with other people. And I was flaky and I denied Jesus. But you know what? Now he's Peter. He's Petros. He's the rock. He's who Jesus called him to be. And he says, you know, I'm not a fisherman any longer. I'm actually a servant of Jesus Christ. He saved me. He changed me. I'm different. And so he shows us the transformation power right there. And to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by, which is speaking of through, another word for this is through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second verse, grace and peace be multiplied to you. I love that. Can I just say it one more time? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. I want to talk this morning about Jesus as a provider. And one of the one of the attributes of our God, and he has many, but that gets overlooked is him as a provider, a supplier. And I want to talk about that because it's a necessity. Because I talked the first week you know, on, I need to change. That was like the beginning message in this series. Like we had to identify, hey, I need to change. And it was like 100% participation in the altar call that week. It was like, we identified, hey, we all need to change. We're all in this boat together. And man, it's such a powerful weekend and began this series with like a power shift that felt like, you know, and just the power God released. And, and then I talked last week. So I identified, I need to change. Then last week I spoke on, I can't change. Man, what do you do when you don't feel, man, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's frustrating. I can't. So I pro- preached last week, I can't, but God can. So I talked about God changing us. And I'm going to continue that this week, that I have everything I need. So that's what the title of this message. I've got it. I've got it. What do I got? I got everything I need to change. You didn't realize this, but you already have what you need. You already have what you need. You just maybe have not accessed. You haven't accessed it. I'm believing we're going to begin to ask, ask, access the provision that God has given us. Because the Bible, we read it this morning. He says that you have already obtained this promise and you have all things you need. 
You have all things you need. The third, the third verse of 2 Peter in the NIV says it like this. His divine power has given us everything we need, everything we need for a godly life, for the life that he's called you to. And I got to tell you, if he called you to it, he's going to equip you for it. He's going to supply it. If he called you to this life, do you think that Jesus would call you to something? that he wouldn't equip you for, that he wouldn't supply the need for. So if there is a need, if there is a need that you said, I need to change, I need it, I need it, I can't, but I need to change, he says, I'm going to supply that need because that's how good I am. I'm going to help you, and you have everything you need. Right now in our country, there is a supply issue. We're seeing it all over that there's supply uh, that, that is becoming Uh, The supply chain has been broken. And so now even where uh, there's even, you know, supply issues with baby formula and you got, you know, parents rightfully so freaking out, like, what what are we going to do for baby formula? And so all these things, there's a supply break. And just when it comes to the things of God, I got to just tell you this. It's not a supply issue when it comes to God. I mean, we see a supply issue in our country, and there's so many different reasons why, and I'm not getting into that, but I'm, I referenced that so you know with God, it's not a supply issue. It's a demand issue. Have we placed demand on God to be that provider for us, to say, God, I need you. I, I need you. I can't do this on my own. And, and he says, when we get to that place, he says, okay, you're, you're, you're ready to receive the provision that I want to supply, he says, you have access to a supply that is even above what many people think could even happen. I think about even the supply and demand and even accessing this supply. I remember a few years back, uh, Taisha and myself, we were away on, on a, a vacation. We were celebrating our anniversary. We were staying at this resort. And while we were there, we were enjoying the resort. It's a beautiful resort, but we were noticing you know, different activities and things that we were observing other people do. And we're like, that looks so much fun, man, that would be awesome to do. And so the whole time we're watching other people enjoy the resort and enjoy these specific activities, golf carts and biking and all this. Uh, there's a ton of stuff that was going on. And I finally asked, I said, hey, how much does this cost? I asked a worker and he says, it's included. It's included. You have, you have access to it. You, and he says, in fact, you already paid for it because you paid when you checked in. The resort fee that you paid has already been paid. You have access. And so it was up until the last day. We didn't even enjoy the whole, the whole benefit of the resort because we chose to be ignorant and say, you know what? You know, we didn't know we had access to this. But sometimes the ignorance is what blocks people when in things of faith that we're ignorant to know that Jesus has paid the price already. It's already been paid and we already have access to these great promises. He says, everything you need for a godly life, you have access to. He says, I have given you access. I think it's important to know, really even an important question to even ask, what does living like a Christian look like? And a lot of times, many people, when you start asking people, what does that look like? It's it's a do list. It's D-O. It's what I do. It's what I do. But really to live a, a life for God is really it's not about do, it's through. It's Christ living through you because he has unlimited supply. And so it's through. We read that this morning. It was multiple times in 2 Peter 1 where you see the word through, through Christ Jesus. It's not of ourself. It's not our own strength. Remember, I can't, but God can. And so when I'm relying on my own strength, when I'm relying on my own ability, I'm going to fall short. That's why we have to tap into the divine supply, y'all. We got to tap into the divine supply that he will give us that will bring forth change. He gives us change. And so really, this message is about the provision you need for change, the provision you need. Provision means the ability to fulfill something. Provision. So if there's a vision for something, it means it's the, it's the ability to, to fulfill it. You know, God has vision for your life. When we start talking about purpose and plans, and God has a vision for your life. And so since he has a vision for our life, he's also going to provide provision to help make it happen. That's why being in the will of God matters so much. 
Because when you're in the will of God, he will always supply whatever the need is. Now, when we get out of God's will and we start doing it in our own way, in our own rebellion, in our own walking, in our own thinking, and are doing it to hit our own way, but there's a guarantee that's put upon it that when we do it God's way, when we walk in God's will, he will always supply the need. He will bring provision to bring forth change. So wherever there is a need, wherever there is something that, that, that is necessary in life that you need to know that God will provide. There's a couple things you need to remember when it comes to need. The first one is this. There's never a situation or circumstance that God's provision can't get to. So wherever you, you go in life and you start, you start you know, having uh, things maybe happen in life and you're like, man, God, what, what, how is this? You, know, you start serving God. Let me just say it like this. Sometimes when you start serving God, all hell can break loose. I found out sometimes the more I pray, the more anointing I begin to walk in. It's like the enemy hates it. It's like the enemy wants to come in like a flood. The enemy wants to try to come against it. And so I have to be able to stand firm and I have to be able to trust God. And I begin to say this. There's not a circumstance or a situation, God, that your provision can't get to. So therefore, I trust that there's not going to be a supply break. This isn't like what we're going through now. There's not a supply break that's going to happen that he can't bring his provision your way. The second thing you need to know is this, is that there's never a need that's too big or small. You notice I didn't just say too big. I said too small as well because a lot of times things that are, too, that are small, we try to handle. It's like, God, we'll handle the small stuff, and we'll just give you the big stuff. He's like, no, give it all to me. I don't want, he says, I don't want you trying to carry even the small weight because I don't want you to be weighted down in life because things in life will weigh you down. And he's like, nah, bring all your need. If it is a need, I want you to bring it to me. Yeah. Come on, if it is a need, he says in Philippians 4.19, he says, if it is a need, I want you to bring it my way. And he says, I will supply all. Somebody say all. All, all means big or small. All means big or small. Maybe you have big needs today. Well, I know a big God. Maybe you have small needs. Well, I know a big God that can even meet small needs. Amen. That word supply right here in in Greek, it, it means to make full, to fulfill, to cause to abound, to furnish, to supply liberally. You know, we got a God that can supply liberally. That means he can make a thing overflow. He can make a thing abound. What was once small, that's why we got to put our our needs in God's hands because Jesus can take little and make it much. You're like, I'm not very much. I'm not, you know, I don't have what it takes. You know, I don't have very much talent. I don't have this or that. But you know what? I know a God who can take just a little bit, just a little something. You just think, oh, it's a, you got just a little life. Now he says, I can make things big if you put it in my life, in my hands. Put your life in my hands and I can, I can cause you to abound. I can multiply you. We read that this morning, grace and peace multiplied. Somebody say multiplied. Multiplication is the way that God works. That's an element that he uses for transformation. It's called multiplication. He says grace and peace multiplied. Side note, the enemy wants to multiply your problems. That's, he wants to multiply your problems. He wants problems to stack up. He wants, multi, he wants problems to, to stack up and, and become, you know, greater and greater. But, you know, we have to trust God that, even though the enemy wants our problems to multiply, we have a God who can cause us to abound. He says, grace and peace multiplied to you. Psalms 73, I want to show you something. It says that my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. This word portion is found in Scripture multiple times. You see this. It's, it's found that God is my portion. And when we read that, a lot of times, at least for me, when I think portion, normally I think of this like, like portion control. I think of like, like tiny bites. I think of restriction. I think of deprivation. I think of denying myself the things that I really want. But that's really... That's that's not what this means. This word portion right here means a perfect measure. 
a perfect supply. When he says, I'm going to supply, I'm going to multiply grace and peace, he says, I'm going to multiply it in such a great, it's a perfect measure of what you need. That means that whatever you're in need of today, he says, I'm going to supply it in perfect measure. Therefore, that you won't, you won't walk in lack, but you will, begin to, you will begin to find out that he is a God who can multiply the blessing and the promises of God. See, what we need in life, the need that we have, Jesus is the only one who can fulfill it. He's the only one who can fulfill it. He's the only one who can give what we really need. You could try to fulfill it with stuff, things, people, happiness, chasing after your own dream. But really, we need it in what he says is a perfect measure, portion. Jesus is my portion. Jesus is my portion. He's perfect measure for my life. He is the divine supply for me. That's why Peter said, make sure your knowledge of him increases. You need to know him. Grace and peace. He says, if you want to walk in greater measure of God's favor, he says, grace, which means undeserved favor, peace, which is the shalom of God, which is not just, you know, many people think of peace as just, you know, something that's weak, but really peace is it's wholeness, it's health, it's safety, it's, it's provision. He says, all these things multiplied, hear me. He says, in your knowledge, it's not you laboring to earn it. It's you getting to know Jesus. See, as your knowing adds up, God multiplies. What I'm saying, you know, this isn't head knowledge. This isn't you just getting book smart. Because there's a lot of people that are book smart, but they're dumb spiritually. It's, it's what Hosea said. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. The NLT version says my people are being destroyed because they don't know me. They don't know that I'm a supplier. They don't, they don't know that I can supply all their need. They just think I can supply material blessing. Like I'm just like I'm a cash machine. But he says, I can supply every need. I can supply every need. Grace and peace will be multiplied to you. And I think we limit God. I think we limit God. I know I'll speak for myself. I limit God. And he says, my supply is endless. I can reach wherever. My reach is, my, he says, so why are you limiting what I want to do? And he says, Many people, it's just they don't know me as a supplier because my people, they don't know me. They don't know me. I think it's time we get to know God a little bit better. I think it's a season of getting to know God a little bit. Let me just say it like this. It's a season you need to get to know your supplier. You need to get to know your supplier. You need to come into relationship with them even stronger because he says, the more you know, the more you know me, the more grace and peace begins to add up and really multiply. Because addition is just, it's a continuous multiplication is a continuing addition over and over and over in greater levels. Get to know him. And when you get to know him, he says, you're going to begin to find out Everything you need to change, you'll have access to. You're not going to be toiling to try to get it and trying to grit your teeth to change. You're going to find that with his grace and favor, transformation and, and, and change, with his help, you can do it. Who you are today, I'm telling you, with God's hand on your life, God working in you and through you, He's going to change you into who he's created you to be, the better version of you. We all can be the worst version. I'm telling you, if I got around the wrong people, I started doing the wrong thing, I, could become, I would become a terrible person. And you're like, what happened to him? 
That's the bad version of me. That's the flesh version. You know, the version of me that want to cuss folk out and act a fool and do stupid stuff and act out. That version, that's not the version I want to become. I want to become more like Jesus. I want, to, I want my spirit man to be the one who leads me, the spirit of God on the inside of me, dwelling in me. He created me. I want to know the supplier, the one who can make that happen because I can't do it on my own. I can't, but God can. He can change me. And I have everything I need to change. The psalmist David wrote a song in Psalms 103. He penned him a song that's a classic, y'all. It's a banger. It hits. I love it. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Second verse. He says, rewind the track. I'm going to say it again. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The benefit speaks of the supply that he brings. Don't forget what God has done. See, normally when you open up a, a prayer request, it's normally, God bless me. David said, I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to bless God. I'm going to bless God. I'm not going to ask God to bless me. I'm going to bless God. Basically, I'm going to return a thank you. I'm going to return saying, thank you, God, for what you've already done. Thank you that I already have all that I need. Thank you, God. Repetition in this scripture is not vain repetition. It's, it's for emphasis. And he begins to talk about his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Forget not all his benefits. It reminds me of the old hymn we used to sing, Count Your Blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God, God has done. It's like the story of the daughter who told the father, I'm going to count the stars. And he said, go ahead. And she's counting and she gets up to like 223, 224, 225. And she begins to lose count. And she says, oh, my, that I got to start all over. I didn't know there was so many stars. It's like us in life trying to count the blessings. We lose track. If you start counting up what God has done, you really will lose track of how good God has been. When he says count the blessings, when he's saying forget not the blessings, but he's basically saying is you find yourself in an impossible task of the supply that God has brought your way. It's endless. It's endless, but he named a few just so we know there's some big things that he does. The psalmist, he says, he forgiveth, he healeth, he redeemeth, he crowneth, and he satisfieth. Those are some biggies right there. He forgives. Basically, he's not holding wrong against you. He's not withholding from you because you've sinned. He says, I want to forgive you. I want you to receive the supply of my forgiveness. I'm telling you, when you receive the forgiveness of God, it will cause you to walk in love. It should. It should. When you've been forgiven, you'll learn, you should give out that forgiveness that you've received. He says he also heals. He heals. You know, I don't think we even thank God for the healing that sometimes we we don't even realize the healing that he's doing in our bodies. Sometimes you just feel off one day and you just think, you know, you think it was you thought it was the coffee that made you feel better. You thought it just was you just getting up and act, but God actually probably healed you and you didn't even know it. God did a work in you and you didn't even know it. I thank God for the healing that I didn't even know that he's done in my body. When there was sickness that was trying to rise up in me and I felt off, but I began to plead the blood. I began to feel better. It was a healing that God gave. You know, even modern medicine has saved many lives, but that's a gift from God. The 19th century gave us people like Dr. 
Dr. Simpson, who introduced chloroform, Dr. Lister, an inventor of antiseptic surgery, and Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing. These are, these are people that, that God gave us as gifts, so therefore we can walk in supernatural healing because that's what modern medicine is, is healing. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Somebody say healing. He redeems. He says, don't forget this. He's a redeemer. So when you start thinking he's running out of forgiveness and healing, nah, uh nah. He got an endless supply, and he also redeems. That means he's going to redeem your life from destruction. He's going to redeem you and save you from hell, but he's also going to redeem your life here on earth. I mean, he saves us from hell, but he also saves our life right now. That means I don't have to live like hell anymore. That's y'all the good crowd. It's all good. Y'all the crowd that never acted out, never did anything wrong, but it's all good. He saves you from having to live like you used to live. You know, he redeemed you from a life you constantly try to destroy. You, con- you, were, you were trying to destroy your life with the stuff you were putting in it, with the people you were sleeping with, with the way that you were living. And he said, I'm going to go ahead and save that life. I'm going to save you. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to bring you back. It's a grace, the power to redeem. To redemption. He says, don't forget that he crowns. This crown is, speaks of the, the victory that we have. It's a, it's a crown of victory. God puts honor upon our brow as forgiven people. We wear this not as a as a show off, look at me, but it's really a crown to say, look what he's done. Now, don't look at me, but look at what he's done. I'm a son of God. Come on, we're, ki- we're, we're God's kids now. And since we're God's kids, man, we have the crown of victory upon our head. Romans 8, 16 says, the spirit himself self bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Oh, you did not know this, but you should you're an heir. You're an heir. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm an heir. Come on, you're an heir. Some of you need to read the Bible more because if you're an heir, that means that we're joint heirs with Christ. And if, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Some of you need to understand something that he wants to crown your brow, your head with loving kindness and tender mercies. Come on, as his kids. That's access that we have. He's a supplier. He's a good God. He's a father that gives good gifts. Good gifts. Some, some of y'all, think he's not a stingy father. He's not a mean father. He's a supplying father. He's a giving father. And he says, I want to supply all your needs. The last one is this. He satisfies. And I'm closing around this. He satisfies. To be satisfied means to be fulfilled. So when I start talking about your need being supplied, my God shall supply all my need. Basically, he will fulfill my life. Therefore, I don't have to go look and search for other things to fulfill it. Let's be honest. We do that. We look for other things. We look for compliments from people. We look for for justification from people and approval for people. And we look for stuff, money, things, all these to fulfill. But none of that will. We should know that that stuff doesn't, but we do it anyway. We need to get set in our mind that Jesus is the only one that can fulfill our soul and satisfy the longing of our soul. He can. I plead with you today, don't go looking into the world to find fulfillment because it won't fulfill. And the joy that it brings will be short. It'll be short. And then you'll wake up the next day and you'll you'll be empty once again. And you'll be frustrated again. But can I, can, can I tell you, Jesus is the one who can satisfy the longing of your soul. He told the Samaritan woman, when you drink from the water I give, you'll never thirst again. You'll always be fulfilled. I want to go to the supplier that will always fulfill me, will never leave me at a place of empty. He says, my cup will run over. Psalms 23. 
He anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. The overflowing cup means abundance. Not just fill to the brim. He says overflow. I'm not even limiting it to myself personally. He says also for your generation. Acts 2, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Come on, I want overflow not just for me, but I want it for my kids. I want it for my families. I want it for the church. Come on, Holy Spirit, overflow. Over, pour out your spirit like we've never seen before. Pour out your spirit in this generation. You said in the last days, God, you're going to supply a power and a, and a spirit that's going to overflow a generation. Satisfy. When you're satisfied, you're basically, you're walking in the purposes and plans of God because he satisfies with Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good, not disaster, to give you a hope and a future. I think of the overflow that he has, how he can satisfy continually. And God can even take what the enemy meant for evil and he can turn it around for good. That's how good he can satisfy. You're like, I got a lot of problems. I got a lot of issues. I got a lot of heartbreak. You need to get to Jesus because he can heal that. He can, he, come on, he can get, make it right and he can satisfy the longing of your soul. The enemy is maybe coming like a flood against you, but let me just tell you something. God will raise up a standard against him. God will take what the, that's what Joseph said, you know, when he was standing before his, his family that turned their back on him. You know, you think that people in the Bible didn't go through anything. Actually, they went through hell. That's why there's testimonies are recorded in Scripture to show us that if God did it for them, he could do it for us as well. But Joseph standing before his family that betrayed him, his brothers that threw him in a pit, And he didn't have bitterness in his heart because it's easy to get bitter with people that do you wrong. But he looked at them with grace and love and he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God turned it around. Why? Because he's a supplier that satisfies the longing of my soul. And my God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Closing around this story and then we're going to dismiss in prayer in a moment. I'm going to pray for you, but It's a gentleman named Samuel Bringle. He was a worker for the Salvation Army in the early 1900s. This story blessed me because my great-grandfather was uh, friends with William Booth, the the gentleman who started the Salvation Army. My great-grandfather had the honor of serving alongside of him and friends with him. And so when I read this, it, it blessed me. And... It says that that William Bringle, he was in Boston, and he was passing by a saloon. One day, like I said, it's in the 1900s, early 1900s, and someone threw a brick at his head and hit him, and and it nearly killed him. He spent 18 months in recovery, and during that time, as he was in recovery, he chose, instead of to get bitter, he chose to allow the Lord to satisfy his soul and supply the need, and he began to write. He wrote a little book. And the little book was called Helps to Holiness. It talked about being sanctified in the process of, of sanctification. And as he wrote that book and he began to distribute it, it became a blessing to people. And thousands of copies were released and distributed. And somebody asked him one time as, after he got done preaching, they said, thank you for your ministry. Thank you for, you know, the book. Thank you for, you know, the, the, what you have spoken. And he said something. He says, We can't just leave it at the book. He says, I got to thank God for the brick. He says, because if there was not a little brick, there would have never been a little book. And so some of you, you, you're, 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 you're mad about the things that have happened in life, but you need to de- get it to God. You need to take it to Jesus, the supplier. And he says, I can take what that brick meant for evil, and I can turn it for good. And your life is going to be a testimony of his goodness and his faithfulness. Somebody needs to give God praise today that maybe there has been trial, but God is getting ready to cause you to triumph. In the name of Jesus, let's pray. Today, just everyone across this room, get before God, however you want to do that, with your hands lifted. I'm, we're going to the supplier right now, the one who can supply all our needs. Lord, thank you that you are the one who can cause us to change. You can bring forth change in our life. 
And so, Lord, I just pray right now over your people as they respond to you, Lord, in this moment. That they're looking at you not only as just a savior, which you are, but you also are a supplier, your provider, you're a way maker, you're a need meter, God. And I just pray that you would begin to do that right now. All that we need, we bring it to you. And I ask right now you begin to fulfill and meet the needs of your people all across this room. In the name of Jesus, I pray it. Amen. Amen. Come on, can somebody give him some praise?